thanks everyone for coming today. As I said, I'm Hannah from Answer the Public. Um, a quick reminder of what our webinar series is all about. So this is, I think it's our fifth now. Um, we're doing them every month and we're talking to industry experts from kind of a range of different industries from kind of SEO to insight, PR to paid search and creative about how you can use search data to read people's minds and make better business decisions. Um, it's just worth me saying, although we're going to be showing you kind of ways that you can use Answer the Public to kind of get more out of your search listening, um, this isn't an Answer Pub the Public tutorial, but we do have one of those over on our YouTube channel. Um, if you want to have a look at that, that's youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Answer the Public. And we will share um, that in the chat for anyone that wants to take a look at the tutorial. So for those of you that have been on our last webinars, um, there could be a couple of points that we repeat just to help people that are new to kind of search listening, but it will be kind of relevant to the topic that we're talking about today as well. Um, so you definitely will still take a lot from today's se session. So who are we talking to today? So first of all, we've got Sam Gilbert. Um, so Sam is a researcher at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. Um, and it's great to have Sam on today. So Sophie and I have been chatting to Sam quite a lot over um, Twitter during um, the kind of pandemic. Sam's been sort of sharing some really, really interesting insights, um, which he'll be sharing with you today. So hi, Sam. I know you're going to introduce yourself a little bit later. Um, nice. But we've also got our regular guest, um, and that's Sophie Coley. So Sophie is the originator of the search listening um, technique. And she's also an author, so she's got a great book out, which is called Consumer Insight in the Age of Google. We'll share that as well um, if you want to take a read of Sophie's book. So today's session. So today we're going to be talking about um, how search listening can help you to really kind of truly understand people. So this webinar is primarily for those that are working in not for profits, including the public sector and academia. Um, so we'll be focusing on that, but it will still be very useful for those who work in marketing um, generally. I'm sure there'll, there'll be a lot that you can take from the session today as well. So sort of please stick around if you're not from any of those sectors, because uh, it will be a valuable session. So um, Sam and Sophie, it'd be great if you guys could um, introduce yourselves and get, give a bit of background um, to what you've kind of been doing up till now. Um, perhaps Sam, you'd like to go first? Yeah, sure. So thanks very much for the uh, for the introduction, Hannah. Um, so, yes, I'm, I'm Sam. I'm a researcher at the Bennett Institute, which is the public policy centre at Cambridge University. But actually, I don't come from an academic background. I come from a marketing and data and tech background. So at the beginning of my career, I spent a long time working in financial services in areas like online banking and e-commerce. And then in 2009, I joined the data company Experian. And one of the jobs I had there was um, head of strategy for the marketing services business. So that's the best part of Experian that provides data and software products to marketers. And that, that was where I got really excited by search data because we had this fantastic product in the portfolio at that time called Hitwise, which was this uh, incredible, a deep, rich repository of, uh, of internet search data that we'll talk a little bit more about later. I then in 2012 uh, left Experian and joined an insurtech startup called Bought by Many as employee number one and CMO. Uh, and I was there and grew that business to around 100 million turnover uh, in the six years to 2018. And one of the things that was really key for us in growing that business was search listening. So we used it not just as a customer acquisition tool uh, through SEO, but also as a way of developing products and ultimately of um, determining our whole business strategy. Uh, and then I um, decided I wanted a bit of a, a bit of a change after that. So I um, came back into academia and joined the Bennett Institute. And there I've really got two things that I'm interested in. So the first one is the political legitimacy of big tech companies like Facebook and Google. Um, but the second one that's really relevant for today is that I, I kind of am on a mission to, uh, I guess, evangelize um, search listening and search data to policymakers 
to academic researchers and encourage them to make use of it. Uh, and I'm also on a mission to um, help digital marketers uh, who understand some of these techniques to use their skills in ways that are kind of socially useful in a broad sense. Yes, that's that's me. Great. Thanks so much, Sam. It's great to have you here today. Um, and Sophie, would you like to say hello? I'm sure there's some people that kind of recognise you that have seen your face on the webinars before, but we've got lots of new people here today as well. So, Yes. Hello, um, I'm Sophie Coley. Uh, I uh, talk about search listening a lot. Um, I, I suppose going backwards, I uh, originally trained as a journalist and thought that, that would be the career I took before falling into digital marketing. Um, and so today I sort of split half my time really working in a digital marketing agency here in Brighton in the UK, um, where I focus on um, audience strategy and, and understanding people really and, and how we can um, help our clients. But um, the rest of my work is really educating people around what we're calling search listening. So for me, I guess I feel like uh, industries like social listening have massively taken off and there's a ton of tools that you can do to to understand what people are talking about online and on, on social media in particular. Um, and there's definitely validity to that. I think that, you know, marketers use social media as an insight source or a way to understand um, the people that they're trying to target all the time. Um, I guess having worked in a, a kind of search marketing agency for much of my career, um, I, I guess I, I got taken a few years ago by this idea that actually we can un understand so much about people from how they search. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm fascinated by that and, and over the last sort of 10 years of my career I've been develop, developing that into a bit more of a research method that I would love to see more people do now whether it's in the marketing industry or outside and, and I think um, having sort of got to know uh, Sam over Twitter and as, 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 as Hannah said like sharing a lot of stories and different pieces of work that have been going on over the, the last few months um, I'm particularly interested in how people who aren't necessarily marketers can make use of search data um, and so, yeah, really excited to uh, explore that a little bit more today. Great. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, so I know there's some people in the chat that are asking if we could repeat your name. So it's um, Sam Gilbert and Sophie Coley. Um, what we'd love you to do is to really kind of get involved in the conversation today on Twitter. So we're using the hashtag search listening insight. Uh, just pause on this slide for a minute because we've got all of our um, Twitter handles on here. So. Sam is at Sam Gill, that's Sam G-I-L-B. I'm at Hannah M. Foster, and Coley is at Coley Bird. Um, and obviously the organizations we work for at, are at Bennett Institute, so that's at Bennett Inst for Sam, at Answer the Public for me, and at Search Listening for um, Sophie. So yeah, we'd love to see uh, the conversation on Twitter. So the house rules are that, obviously, and um, please do ask questions today. So. Um, we've actually got Gary, who is uh, the founder of Answer the Public. He's in the chat room, so he's going to be helping you out with anything as we're going. Um, please do submit your questions because we'll have some time at the end um, to answer those. Cool. OK, um, so, yeah, that's kind of straight into it. So for the first question, and I guess um, it will probably be good for Sophie to start with this one. So, um, Sophie, what do you think it is that makes search data such a rich source of insight about the human psyche? Um, and how do you think that organisations should be using it? So uh, anyone who recognises some of the wording in that question that you've just asked will be familiar with this book. Um, so this is Everybody Lies by Seth Stevens davidovitz um, And I think he probably is, is one of the first people to kind of um, launch any um, books around this kind of subject area. Um, it's an absolutely fascinating book. And if you haven't read it already, then I thoroughly recommend that you do. Um, so his book explores, um, I mean, he covers off all sorts of very, very, very interesting subjects from politics to um, porn to all sorts of things that people might lie about uh, if you ask them with other kind of research methods um, and, and gain lots of truth from, from their searches and from other kind of online observed behaviour as well. Um, but he, uh, this, this quote is the one that I read in that that massively, massively stuck with me. So I'm now convinced that Google searches are the most important data set ever collected on the human psyche. And, and the thing for, for me from that is, is, well, A, I wholeheartedly agree, um, and I'm sure Sam does as well. Um, but actually the fact that, yes, uh, I guess 
I've worked in search marketing for 10 years and, and it, search is a data set that I'm very familiar with. And I know that certainly search marketers or online marketers will be. But actually, the potential of that, you know, I guess SEO and paid media, whatever it is, are set up to sell people things. Right. And so the, the kind of search insights that those people working in those industries are into is how many people are searching for red shoes or, you know, things that, that we can sell to them. But actually, if you think about how humans use Google, we don't just search Google when we want to buy something. Perhaps Amazon we do. And, and there's arguments that that's kind of the biggest search engine going now. But actually, we turn to Google at those really, really critical moments in our life. So it could be that, you know, you're a new parent up in the middle of the night with a screaming child and, and you don't know what to do. Your instinct, and it's the way we are now, typically, is to turn to your phone, to your um, smart device, whatever it is, maybe your laptop, and, and ask Google for, for some help. Um, obviously, you know, you're not literally asking Google, you're looking for a community that might be beyond Google, but Google is certainly your first port of call. Um, and again, having played with search data for years and years now, I'm always, always fascinated by the sorts of things you see in there. And as I said, it's not just commercial queries. There's people, people tell Google things, right? So almost in, in a way that, and I don't think this is always voice search, but people have conversations with Google in effect where you see things like, um, I'm scared to go to the gym. And you think that's not someone actually asking a question or overtly looking for um, a specific answer to something. It's someone sharing how they feel with Google. And, and yes, there probably is a motivation beyond that to actually, you know, find ways to overcome that that fear of the gym. But it, yeah, there's there's so much interesting stuff in search for me um, and the way that Google or search engines, I think, wherever you are, um, are just this big repository of, of secrets and things that we probably don't tell, you know, medical things. We don't tell people um, anything else that's going on in, in our lives, but we might tell Google. Um, and just some stats to back that up, really. So um, according to Internet Stats, Internet Stats Live, these are the latest figures they've got. But um, three and a half billion searches uh, every day. And uh, that equates to one point two trillion searches per year. So, you know, search as a data set is absolutely massive. Um, and then the other interesting thing for me on that is that actually, if you think about um, the growth or the newness in that data set, um, actually, 50, so this was Google back in April 2017. So I'm not sure what the latest sort of update on this is. But back then they were saying that 15 percent of searches we see every day are new. And I think if you think, I don't know, certain life events or things that are going on in the world at the moment, uh, we're going to go there, coronavirus, uh, that number is going to shoot up phenomenally in terms of searches that we've never seen before because there's new experiences going on around us and new things that are coming into our lives all the time um, and actually our default is to, to go to, to Google and I know there's some really interesting data sets out there on um, how people have been using search around coronavirus that we'll, we'll cover off a little bit later but yeah um, it's I think it comes down to for me search is a, a data set that has been monopolized by marketers but actually it's so revealing and uh, anyone who wants to help people communicate with people understand people in any sort of way um, ought to be making use of it yes so I guess just to speak a little bit to the second part of Hannah's question which is like how organizations ought to use and um, search data and um, I guess one of the things that's notable is that the thing that everybody knows search data is useful for which is search engine optimization so um, tweaking your website to make it perform better in Google search listings. This is kind of the the most uninteresting use of search data, in in, in my opinion. Um, and I kind of think there's there's at least three other ways in which it can be a really really powerful tool for all types of organisations in the public sector and the not for profit sector and academia, as well as in um, in the commercial world. Um, so the first one really speaks to this point that Sophie's been making about the the dynamism and the newness of uh, so much of the search data. So one way that organisations can get a lot out of it is by um, tuning into it, by listening to it, and then creating original content that speaks to the new questions that your audience is asking. And um, so as Sophie said, like one of the uh, massive breakout search trends of this year inevitably has been searched for things to do with coronavirus and for uh, COVID-19 and, and, and these types of keywords. Um, so just to, to give one example, uh, in the early stages of the lockdown, a lot of people were searching 
uh, were, were making searches that began can coronavirus live so things like can coronavirus live on food um, can coronavirus live on cardboard uh, reflecting the fact that people are getting loads more deliveries uh, than they had been previously and one of the things that was noticeable about this was which organizations were tuned into that data and were creating content to answer those questions so i guess what, what you would hope uh, in terms of the the like g general good for the the public in the uk would be that a website like gov.uk or nhs.uk would be tuned into that data and so they would be providing an authoritative answer to the question can coronavirus live on cardboard and um, unfortunately in, in fact what happened was the people who were tuned into that or the organizations that were tuned into that were broadcasters and journalists so if in April you'd Googled can coronavirus live on cardboard in the UK, the top result was not the NHS, it was Heart FM. So mm -hmm. every, like, everybody loves Heart FM, right? But that, that, that's not the organisation that should be giving the definitive answer to a question that's like really important for, um, for public health. So I think like like creating creating content based on those new searches that are emerging is just a, a thing that all organisations should should do. Um, another thing I wanted to mention was search data is also a, a, like a great place to find new opportunities for for products and services that you can develop, and that's kind of been done mostly so far in the commercial sector. So there's a retail business called World Stores that. Um, managed to find all manner of unusual searches for home and garden products. So my, my favorite example was trundle beds. Like I, I still, I'm not really sure what a trundle bed is, but they noticed this was trending in search data um, and developed content and found a supplier of trundle beds and were able to grow their beds business uh, as a result. So if we kind of apply that then in a public sector context at the moment there'll be loads of search that we haven't seen before on topics like the furlough scheme or redundancy or lockdown rules and it's just a, a great opportunity for organizations that are focused on those areas to tune into that data and use it to inform the new products and services that um, that, that they're developing and then i guess like just to take that like one step further um, search data can also be a thing that like, drives your entire um, strategy as an organization. So I mentioned bought by many of the insurance technology business that I was involved with. And actually, um, search data analysis um, was the thing that showed us the right segment of the market to focus on was pet insurance, because we could see um, a lot of unmet, uh, unanswered questions where people were searching for information about insurance for specific breeds of dog like pugs or specific breeds of cats like Maine Coons and that that is the reason why we ended up building a pet insurance business because the search data uh, revealed that that was the, uh, the, the the biggest opportunity that was was out there and I think like, like again um, although that that type of approach has mostly been applied in the private sector and in commercial contexts uh, it, it is absolutely applicable to uh, the public sector and to the not-for-profit sector too. Okay, that's really interesting. Thanks, Sam. And I guess actually the um, the next question, so it kind of leads on from that. So you've mentioned a couple of examples there, um, but who else in this space is already making kind of good use of this kind of data? And um, what I know you, I've seen some things that you've written on Medium. Um, it'd be great if you could sort of share some kind of interesting projects that you know of as well. Yeah, sure. Yes, so I think I think outside of a, a commercial context, there's really two categories of people who are making really great use of search data. And so the first one is researchers, and particularly researchers in the fields of public health. So actually, if you look at peer-reviewed academic journals, um, there's actually been hundreds of papers published by academic researchers. Um, so many, in fact, that there's a there's actually a new word for this discipline of applying search data to public health, which is infodemiology. Uh, and so some of the researchers who are associated with that, um, there's a guy called Nicola Brigazzi at York University in Toronto in Canada, 
who has uh, done a lot of research using search data into infectious disease outbreaks. So he's looked at, at SARS and at MERS and at West Nile virus and at Ebola and uh, actually also published a really interesting paper on the Zika outbreak when that happened in 2016. And um, if you remember the kind of media coverage about Zika, it was very much focused on this um, rare and unusual and very distressing symptom, which was babies being born with abnormally small heads when mothers, expectant mothers, had contracted the Zika virus. And so that was kind of very, a very shocking thing. Um, but actually, that was not a particularly common symptom of the Zika virus. And uh, what Brigazzi was able to show was that internet search for uh, microcephaly, which is the medical term for babies being born with small heads, was just far, far greater than internet search for other important indicators of Zika infection, like conjunctivitis. Um, he was also able to show that there really wasn't very much search for the actions that people could have been taking to reduce the transmission of Zika virus. So because it was a mosquito-borne virus, a really, really important public health actions were things like draining areas of standing water or just generally avoiding places where mosquitoes can breed. So what that analysis reveals was that um, the important public health messages weren't necessarily getting through to, um, to the people who needed to know about them. And so, so another kind of more recent example in this area is work by uh, Bill Lampos, who's a computer scientist at UCL. And he and his team have been looking at symptom search for, um, for COVID symptoms as a way of forecasting the, the spread of the disease. And so on this, sorry, this slide is probably a little, a little bit of an eye test, but the middle column of this slide here is showing the searches that are most predictive of the spread of COVID-19. And a lot of them are not necessarily the things that back in March when Bill started working on this model that you would have expected. So it includes things like the search blue face, which is very highly predictive of coronavirus spread. Uh, it also includes searches for anosmia or the loss of smell. And then there are other symptoms of the disease towards the bottom of the chart, which are kind of going the opposite direction. So, so more searches for respiratory symptoms, for example, that suggests that there's going to be fewer cases of COVID rather than more. So by using search data in this way, what Bill has been able to do is develop a predictive model that can forecast COVID cases around 17 days in advance of the official statistics that are, are released by the authorities. Uh, and so that, that model uh, now is part of the Public Health England uh, reporting pack that they, they produce, which is just like, like a really fantastic, powerful example of how search data can be used um, for, to, to enable an outcome that I think it's easy to agree is really in everybody's benefit. Um, so then the, the the second category of people who are like already making really good use of search data in a non-commercial context is digital marketers and and particularly digital marketers who um, care deeply about a particular social issue. So a couple of examples um, there uh, in Finland, there's a digital marketer called Eva Kutaniemi who has been able to through the analysis of internet search data. Um, highlight seasonal patterns in domestic violence. Uh, and the reason that's really important is that in some countries, uh, there's good sources of public data that mean that um, organizations that support victims of domestic violence and law enforcement have a good understanding of when domestic violence occurs. But that, the, that quality of data doesn't exist in every country around the world. Um, but what is far more likely to exist is Google data. So by creating this search data driven model, um, Ava has, has, has built something that can really help uh, in, in other countries where the statistics are not as good on domestic violence. And so, so the other uh, digital marketer who's in a similar vein that I wanted to talk about is a guy called Patrick Berlinkett, 
who is a, a search engine marketing agency owner uh, based in New York. And he's uh, applied his own methodology. It doesn't, it doesn't come from Google Trends as some of this other research does. It comes from his expertise in Google AdWords. Um, and, and he's essentially applied search listening to look at major social issues like high school shootings. Uh, he's also looked at the opioid crisis and been able to show that around 900,000 people in the United States every year ask Google where they can buy heroin or how they can use heroin or how they can stop using heroin. And so by doing that, he's been able to surface these really powerful insights for policymakers and for substance misuse um, uh, charities and organizations that just makes them much, much better informed about, uh, about these, these issues. Um, Patrick's also done this really interesting product building on the work that Bill Lampos and others have done on uh, symptom search for COVID-19. Uh, so so he's, he's focused on a specific symptom identified by that analysis, which is the loss of smell that we touched on earlier. And by running um, Google Ads and generating search data for running Google Ads, he's been able to show both in the US and in Tanzania, which you can see on the slide here, um, where the emerging potential COVID hotspots are. And so Tanzania is a particularly interesting case because it's one of the few countries around the world that has a, a leader that was kind of in denial about the seriousness of COVID-19. And um, in this, by, by the time that this data is from, the official position of the government was that there had only been 509 cases of COVID-19 in Tanzania, and actually they, they defeated the virus. It wasn't a problem anymore. What Patrick's search data was showing was people searching for this symptom of loss of smell, which is really indicative that um, coronavirus is spreading. And they were searching for it, not just in the largest and most international city, which is Dar es Salaam, but also in smaller cities like Arusha, and also in the capital of Dodoma, where um, three MPs had, had mysteriously died in unexplained circumstances. So one of the other things this uh, underlined, similar to Ava Kutaniemi's work on domestic violence, is that Google search data can fill gaps in official statistics and give you something to corroborate official statistics against when you have good reason not to trust them. Okay, great. Yeah, some really interesting examples there, which kind of leads on to the next question, which um, is how do how do you think that people um, on this webinar can actually get to that data? How do how do they find out those kind of insights and start actually kind of using them um, for for their clients, but also for you know themselves for to for their own marketing careers and to to have that kind of um, work that's sort of socially useful too. I guess that was one, perhaps Sophie, that you could start with for that one. Yeah, sure. So so I guess there's a point here that when we talk about search data, uh, certainly in the UK or in any market where Google is the dominant search engine, we're effectively talking about Google data. So what I'm going to talk about, I guess, will relate to Google, but actually you can apply this wherever you are if you're looking at um, the, the kind of leading search engine and the most frequently used search engine. You can also apply, um, I think I saw someone in, in the chat ask a question about Amazon and, and can you actually look at like Amazon searches. You can't necessarily get their data uh, if they own that data, but you can basically any website that kind of pre-predicts what you're going to populate when you search for something, uh, that they, they, the kind of algorithm that feeds that is, is you would hope if it's any good is is observing the behavior of people on the website and trying to shortcut them getting to whatever is the most popular thing whether it's a product an, an article whatever it is um so you can apply that thinking to any website that you're on really if they've got a search functionality that kind of predicts what it might be that you're going to search for either by showing you trends or you know starting to complete what it is you're going to search for um then you can do that uh, and that should work wherever you are um providing that they're using a kind of uh, half sophisticated algorithm so with that thinking in mind my my favorite place and it's the easiest most accessible place to start with exploring search data is literally google search suggestions so i'm just going to jump in and share my screen
So if we just literally start with Google. So one thing to say is that um, you should always go into an incognito mode or make sure you're not signed in because you, your suggestions will be reflecting um, your own search behavior if you don't do that. But basically, you know, what I just said in that Google suggestions are basically what Google can see as popular where you are. So um, again, this will be tailored likely to where you are. So um, any suggestions you see will be lo like localized and relevant to where you are, but you could use VPNs and other things to kind of explore other, other countries um, or cities if that was what you were particularly interested in. But you can start to play with really, really interesting things. So, so something I always like to look at, I kind of think of this as like the mood of the nation, if you like. But um, if you just type something like, should I, you can see the top suggestion Google's coming back with at the moment is, should I wear a mask? Um, should I travel to France? Should I quit my job? And if you think of these suggestions as eff effectively kind of a, a top 10, if you like, um, you will see trends in this. So if I looked at this again tomorrow and the next day and the next day, the, the terms might shift in position. Some of them might become more popular and creep their way to the top of the list. Some might drop out altogether and some, some new ones might come in. Um, but it's been really, really interesting. So this is something I, certainly the, the should I search term, I was tracking um, from the beginning of kind of lockdown here in the UK. Um, so if I just show you this, this was a, a little visualization that I built, but you can see uh, this was from the beginning of March. The top should I's were around, should I travel? Should I travel to Italy, to London? Should I go on a cruise? All that sort of thing. Should I travel to Thailand? Um, and you can see here, you know, terms dropping out and coming in and, and moving up and down that top 10, like I said. Um, so that was interesting to start with, that certainly for the beginning of March, for, for where I was, um, it was all around travel. The new normal started coming in towards the end. So we saw things like, oh, should I delete the house party app, which was when there were lots of um, private privacy and data breach concerns around um, house party. Um, things like, should I wash my shopping came in? Um, should I wear a mask actually started coming in on the 14th of April. So that was, I think, before, um, certainly in the UK, before it was actually sort of mandatory to wear a mask in shops and that sort of thing. Should I be shielding? All these terms coming through. Um, so, yeah, we'll, sh we'll share the link with that so that you can check it out. But my point here is that actually if you're using Google suggestions, you can be tracking those trends that you see um, and, and think about the language that you start to explore. So what seed terms can you use that people might um, search with to explore kind of public mood and sentiment? So um, can we would be another one. So at the moment, can we travel to France to Wales? You will get odd queries in there where people, I don't know, uh, search sort of more popular culture things. Um, you often see random things that when you actually search them, you understand it's a crossword clue, for example. Um, but that doesn't kind of um, deduct from the, the fact that this is really, really insightful um, information here. Uh, I think are we allowed to at the moment is another interesting one to look at given um, living sort of throughout a lockdown. But you can see here, are we allowed to hug really now? Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I spend ages sort of digging into this stuff. It's really, really fascinating for me. So yeah, play with this. As I said, um, it will be local to you, but you can use VPNs to explore other locations. Play with the, the terminology that you're looking at. Um, another tip that I often give people that I think is probably quite useful in a non-commercial um, sense is thinking about like possessive pronouns. So um, thinking about things like my health. And you can go back and put the space at the beginning as well. Um, to like manage my health um, or like uh, my eyesight maybe. But you get, this is what I was talking about earlier with the actual statements that people are putting into Google. They're not asking a question necessarily, but they're telling Google what is wrong with their eyesight. Um, and you can go back to the start of the query and put a space in there. And I, I sort of treat that like a wildcard methodology, if you like. Um, but you can see why is my eyesight getting worse, how to improve my eyesight, all those sorts of things. So um, that's free and it's super, super easy and simple to do. Um, the kind of step on from that, I suppose, which is still free, um, is Answer the Public, which if you're not familiar with Answer the Public, as I said, there's a free version and there's a pro version, which has some more sort of sophisticated uses. The, the key thing for me with the pro version is that you can um, start to track search terms that you're particularly interested in and see how those changes occur over time. Um, and with Answer the Public as well, you can choose, um, obviously, where in the world you are. So you can see searches um, relevant to your country. Um, and you can also look at different languages as well, if that's what you're interested in. But if I stick with that, like my eyesight example, just put in your term here um, and then hit search. If I give it a couple of minutes. 
um, you will see what you get back is a huge, huge data set. And what Answer the Public does is it, it, it effectively um, replicates what I was doing with Google suggestions, but at scale um, and with a whole load of different qualified sort of search terms um, to help you get to a, a kind of richer data set, I suppose. So as it loads, you'll start to see these wheels will turn into numbers, which tells me that I have some data. So uh, my eyesight was obviously the seed term that I put in. Um, and then it combines your kind of seed term with all these sort of bridge words, as I would explain them. Um, so like how and my eyesight. So we can see then it's how can my eyesight get better. Um, a little, if you're not used to using this, the, the green dots, the darker the green, then the more popular that search term. So effectively, the higher in Google suggest suggestions it's being returned. Um, so will my eyesight get better? Will it keep getting worse? That sort of thing. Um, it also has a whole load of prepositions. So can is with, for, without and to. Um, it does some comparisons as well. So um, looking at ands and verses and those sorts of things. Uh, and then uh, it basically goes through the whole alphabet. Alphabet. So it's like I've gone my my eyesight A, my eyesight B, my eyesight C. But it's a tongue twister when you try and say it that quickly. Um, but yeah, so it gives you a huge, huge data set. Um, it, it returns it like this, but you can download it um, as a CSV. You can also look at it in lists if you're struggling with the wheels um, and start to see all of those as well. Um, but yeah, like I said, one, one of the best things here is that you can actually um, set up alerts once you're a pro user so that you can start getting emails that tell you when there's a, a newly popular search term around your thing, which, again, as uh, if you're working in a, an organisation that, that kind of has some um, desire or responsibility to provide um, authoritative, accurate information at a time when it's super, super pertinent, then actually this is the sort of thing that you should be tracking because you want to see when these searches um, are becoming most most popular. Um, so yeah, that's that's answer the public. Uh, as I said, you can use it for free or you can use the paid model. Um, but for me, it's just the I think as as a ex sort of journalist marketer, um, I am much more familiar with with data like that, and it's so accessible for me that you can actually um, just jump into it. Uh, it's really really good. Yeah, that's such a fantastic tool. And um, so yeah, I. I I, I, I love it. Um, the, maybe another thing just to add to it, one of the big advantages I think Answer the Public has over um, tools like Google Trends is that it gives you much kind of deeper and richer insight based on whatever seed keywords you're interested in. Um, I, I was maybe just going like, to add, add a few things about other places that you can find search data if you want to get into doing this type of analysis yourself. So. Um, a lot of the academic work that has been done in this area has used Google Trends. So sometimes just using the Google Trends interface that you're probably already uh, familiar with. Um, but most of the time using the Google Trends API. And um, so that's that's a kind of pipe into uh, the whole data set that sits underneath that Google Trends tool. And it's also worth noting that the Google Trends API is only available to for non-commercial uses. So it's a kind of uh, a data source that you can access as somebody who doesn't work in the commercial sector that isn't available to people who do. Um, if you're a, a real serious statistician, uh, there's also an R package called GTrends R, which will do a kind of equivalent job to the Google Trends API. Um, if you if you like R as a as a, a bit of anal analysis software, um, there's also in the kind of free uh, data sources, a, a variety of coronavirus specific data sets that have been released. So Google released an interesting data set. Um, Bing has released a data set that it's uh, keeping up to date. And we'll, we'll probably send around afterwards some, some links to where you can find those. And then there's also some really great um, paid for sources of search data. So the most obvious of those, I guess, is Google Ads. So the work that Patrick Berlinkett was doing on the opioid crisis and on loss of smell search, that is basically using search data that he's gathering through the process of running Google Ads campaigns. So both through the keyword planner, but then also the click data that comes back when you run an ad campaign. Um, but if you, you want kind of a deeper, richer, more complex data, there's also some software as a service products that you can license to get that. So um, I mentioned earlier on Hitwise 
Um, so the Hitwise search intelligence product, that was the, the best source of the data. Unfortunately, Hitwise um, closed its doors earlier this year, so that's no longer available. Probably the next best uh, established solutions to that are SEM Rush, which is the software as a service product for marketers, and similar web, likewise. Um, so they've got some, some good deep data on searches. And then what I'm kind of really excited about, that's a, that's a new thing, is a, a, a company, Kaizam, which is a big search data analytics business. And um, they're focused mainly on retail, but they've also done some really interesting work in the education sector and in the healthcare sector. They have built this product called the Kaizam Data Source, which they're essentially intending to be a, a replacement for what um, Hitwise was. So hopefully that gives you some um, some other things to get stuck into as well. But yeah, as I, as I said before, like I can't recommend Answer the Public highly enough. It's a fantastic tool. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, it's great to get that from you. And what we'll do is we'll actually share this slide on Twitter because I think it'd be really helpful for people to be able to take this away and um, have a go with some of those tools. So yeah, we will tweet this one so you can print it off and um, have a look at some of those tools yourselves. Um, great. OK, well, that was really, really helpful. And I'm sure um, people have taken a lot from that advice that you've given them. It'd be great if we could ask a few questions. I can see that um, Gary has actually been answering a lot of them for us in the chat. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, if we could start with this one. So I think you probably covered some of this off, Sophie, and what you were talking about earlier. Um, but if we could just kind of go back to this. So how can we identify what problem people are trying to resolve on a specific topic? So where would you kind of start with that? So so I suppose your topic becomes kind of the seed term that you might pop in to answer the public or you might explore um, in Google suggestions. I think that the biggest thing for me, um, and again, coming from a, a kind of more commercial marketing world, uh, is is that it may, maybe it's less prevalent in a, a less commercial world, but people can get really fixated on, well, our thing is called this, and therefore we'll put that term in and that's all we'll do. So what I would encourage is just playing with multiple kind of variants and really trying to anticipate not even the full thing that someone might say or might ask, but how might they refer to the area that you're interested in. And so so that's why I was talking about my eyesight. So you might want to put like eyesight in to answer the public, but you you, you would put, put my eyesight in and you might put um, poor eyesight in. There's all different kind of variations that you. it's really important, I think, because search is effectively a, a linguistic thing, right? So actually anticipating the different phrasings that people might have around the area that you're interested to explore is really really important um but you know you can always start with the term that you're most familiar with and most comfortable with and actually i would expect that as you explore search data around that you would find other phrases or, or terms that you might want to explore further yeah i think that's that, that's really great advice and i'd, I'd maybe just add that like I'm, I'm a big advocate for also just just personally reading a lot of this data, just just kind of um, skimming through it, and uh, what I find is, as you as you do that, you get a sense of what the the bigger themes are that exist around the the keyword that you've started with, and obviously in this like age of big data and machine learning, uh, people's natural inclination is sometimes to try and find an automated way of doing it, but actually just just reading all these keyword variations can be like really really rewarding in terms of insight. Massively. And I think, you know, the, the nice thing with Answer the Public is that it kind of groups the kind of um, bridge terms, like I said. So you can put your seed in and it will group all of the why questions around that for you. But, yeah, it's a really good point from Sam that actually don't don't be fooled into thinking that that's it, job done and everything's categorised. Like one of my favourite things to do is to open up some sort of mind mapping software and have maybe five different Answer the Public wheels around one topic in all different tabs. And then I draw my own conclusions and start to creep create my own map kind of thing based on all the themes that I've seen. But yeah, it's so important to do that human analysis on top of it. Great. Thanks, Sophie and Sam. Um, so this is a really interesting question that's come in, actually. So um, somebody saying that the charity that they've worked for works with women who have experienced sexual violence. So in terms of data sets, um, this person is saying that they believe that a lot of data is not available from search engines. So the example they've given is kind of look for rape on answer, on answer the public or any kind of search engine. Have you got any kind of tips on data sources that they could use for that? So perhaps Sam, that might might be one for you. Yeah, sure. So, so this is this is such an important point, and it's it's actually one of the um, 
like I guess an unintended consequence of Google trying to um, like, I don't know, like, like remove harmful content from search results. Um, it, it, researchers who are interested in uh, issues like racism or uh, radicalization, and they also come up against this problem because Google has kind of in advance removed a lot of the searches that will be most powerful. And um, so the way that um, one used to be able to overcome this problem was um, by essentially not looking at Google-based data, but instead going to a different source. So you certainly used to be able to look at this in the Hitwise data set. I haven't actually tried looking for that type of data in SEMrush or similar web. No, I haven't um, in, in Chiasm's data, but, that, but I think it's probably in that kind of bottom right hand quadrant that, that that would probably be the best bet to try and find that sort of data. And yeah, I mean, it, 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 these, these kind of issues, like like it, um, the, the data could be really, really powerful for addressing them. So, so I really hope that um, some of those will be helpful. It's also worth saying on this, I suppose, um, it's where some of um, Patrick Bellinket's work is quite interesting because I guess the point here is that I, I think the question kind of implies it, but it's not that people aren't searching around these issues. They absolutely are. It's just that Google's not releasing the data. So um, as I understa understand uh, Patrick Berlinkett's, a lot of his work around um, sort of the opioid stuff that Sam was talking about earlier is where um, it's, it's a fascinating method, but he's actually running paid adverts against terms that he thinks might be interesting. And from that, he's, he's able to like capture his own data, right? It's not relying on Google to share the data. Yeah, that's right. That's such a great point. Cool. OK, thank you for that. Um, so another question. So this person saying that my organisation is interested in very specific audiences. So the example they're given is um, policymakers rather than the general kind of population. Um, is it possible to explore search data for targeted groups? I know you've kind of touched on this with some of the stuff that you've said um, about Hitwise and Kaizen. But yeah, what would what's the advice that you'd give to that? So I guess like the, it's both a positive and a negative that the nature of search data is that it's aggregated, like it's the the, the collective consciousness of humanity really. So it's it, it's difficult just to look at um, the searches that come from specific segments of the the population. Um, it, it like it. Again, it, I mean, it used to be possible to do this with Hitwise. It may be possible to do this with some of the commercially available software as a service products. Um, however, like, like in this specific example, I'm not necessarily sure that it's necessary because the like the policy world kind of has its own vocabulary. It's got you know there are phrases that uh, policymakers will be interested in and students of public policy will be interested in that. Um, the wider general public is not going to use. I mean, the ones just like off the top of my head, you know, the leveling up agenda um, or constitutional crisis. Um, this, this kind of the use of this type of specialist vocabulary, um, in some respects, that kind of helps define the um, the segment for you. So I, I think it's probably possible to like iteratively um, using tools like Answer the Public, like find your way towards the um, keywords like that, that that define your audience and then you can use those to, as the basis for your insights. Yeah, I'd, yeah, it's, it comes down to language, doesn't it? So it's that if you can almost try and segment your language, your audience, uh, by a certain word or phrase that they might use, then that helps. Um, and then the other point, I think I saw a question on it earlier, is just that um, you, uh, you can at least, and I know it's not the question around sort of um, policymakers, but you can uh, drill it down to a geographical location. So actually comparing um, searches made in a city versus another city. I did a little um, shout out experiment on Twitter a while ago, um, asking for different people around the world to tweet me with what they were getting as the suggestions when they, um, I can't even remember what seed I used, but I, I gave everyone like one seed term and said, what do you get? I think it was like a can I or can we type, type search. Um, in fact, it was are we? Um, and yeah, the, the responses from all around the world and even in different cities in the UK that I was getting was different. And so I guess that's indicative that, you know, as long as you are you can either um, be in that place and then perform the searches from there or get someone to do it for you or use a VPN to kind of replicate that, then you can see um, different geographies. 
Great. OK, thank you. Um, cool. So this is quite a, an interesting question in terms of like how the data can be practically used. So there's someone here saying that they work for a not for profit um, organisation, Humans for Race, and they support coral restoration programmes. Um, they're saying if they understood correctly with Google search data um, or answer the public, they can create content addressing concerns um, using the word, word corals. Is that kind of practically how you would go about it? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, maybe not. Well, maybe corals, maybe not. Uh, yes, start there and then explore, you know, I mean, that was the, the kind of charity work for coral reef restoration. So maybe you might want reef restoration. You might think, actually, I, uh, if you knew know that the people who are going to um, throw sort of more weight behind that group are into diving, you might want to explore diving as a, a sort of subset of that. So I think think quite broadly around it. But yes, that's certainly a, a decent starting point, I think. Yeah, maybe just to add a little bit to that. So, so the actually the, the term coral raises a kind of interesting uh, question about search data, which is, well, the jargon term for it is lexical ambiguity, i.e. Uh, searches for coral might be for coral reefs. They might also be for the, 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 the bookmaker um, that's called coral. Um, so I think, um, I, I guess maybe what I would recommend is like, making a list of the keywords that most specifically define um you know reef conservation or, or whatever the, the broader topic is and then just experiment a bit and see see which ones seem like they give the best results and have the fewest false positives cool okay thank you guys um so we get asked this question um quite regularly on our webinars but i think it's always a good one to answer um is there a way to gauge how many people are searching for an individual search term <laughs> Uh, yeah, yes and no. So um, in Answer Public, like I said, I would go by the dots. So that's telling you what is more popular. Um, I think in, in some of the other tools, absolutely. So I mean, Google, um, the ad planner, absolutely um, is set up to give you volumes. What I would say, um, and there's a there's a plugin that you can get that you can use over the top of Answer the Public called Keywords Everywhere, which in theory, when you hover over one of the terms in the wheel, it will tell you how many people are searching for it. In reality, um, every time I've done that, I get told that there are zero, 10, 20, 50 searches a month for those terms. I think if you rewind back to what I said at the start of, of this webinar, which is that there are billions of searches happening um, every day on Google, it's just if, if they're the top suggestions that Google is showing and it's doing that based on other people making those searches, then albeit, yes, they will all vary around the world, but it's just not you know, the maths doesn't add up to say that there's no one searching for this because Google's suggesting it and it's suggesting it because it knows it's a popular, important search term. So that for me then goes back to the point that, that the keyword planner tool from Google, which is where most people get volume data from, uh, it's set up for paid marketing, really. So it's it's set up so that someone who sells holidays knows how much they need to spend. Um, and and that, that cost is based on how many people are making the search for flights to Thailand, for example. Um, it's a commercial tool, right? It's set up for that. And, and um, it's certainly something that I would love to see change. I would love to see Google releasing accurate volume data for what is called more long tail queries. So um, yeah, the more interesting, longer, uh, richer, more human truth based um, search queries. It's something that, um, yeah, it's on my, my list of sort of to do. I'd love to see that change. But um, ultimately, it's really difficult. I don't know if Sam has any other um thoughts to, to add to that yeah well, well first of all I want to um, echo and amplify that that point about I, I guess like in, in my opinion like I, I just try not to get too hung up on what the the reported volume for a specific keyword is um, for, for all the reasons that um, Sophie just described um, I, and you know I, I think this point about AdWords being a commercial tool is is so important because what that means is like the system, the AdWords system and the data in it is sort of inherently biased towards monetizable search terms. And if you're in the public sector, not the profit sector, academia, a lot of the search terms that you're going to be interested in are of their nature, not remotely monetizable. 
And so I just don't trust Google to have fantastic data on that available through AdWords. Um, I mean, if, if, if you really want to get um, volume data, then the ways that you can do it, like the, again, bottom right quadrant of the chart, those tools will all provide indications of volume. They come with all of the same limitations that the AdWords data is going to come with because ultimately they're, they're playing um, or, or they're, they're like doing some kind of inferring of the volume based on how much advertisers are willing to bid for it. Uh, but but you, you can get something. Um, the other thing that's worth knowing about is in Google Trends. Um, Google Trends will return you a relative volume for any search term. Uh, so it's, it's it's not it's not an absolute volume. It's on a scale of naught to one hundred. But if you have a search term where you know the volume yourself, so let's say it's the brand name of your organisation, then you can do a comparison chart in Google Trends and infer the volume for the keyword that you're interested in based on what Google reports your brand or whatever it is, the, the relative volume for that. So yeah, there's, there's, there's workarounds. I just I, I just agree with Sophie that it's not a thing that I would like like prioritize. I think we, we talked about it as well, but I think it's in how you think about this data. And for me, you know, I started with Seth Stevens Davidovitz's quote about this being the most important um, data set ever collected on the human psyche. I like to also think of it as kind of Google is the world's biggest focus group, if you like. Um, and actually, I, I sort of think, you know, in a focus group, you don't you don't come away from the focus group and then go, right, well, here were the interesting things that came out of it. And uh, we're only going to focus on these ones because they were the ones that everybody said, you know, it's it's about um, understanding the, the niche and the the kind of, um, yeah, different different needs from different audiences rather than just trying to go for kind of the most popular, I think, sometimes. Brilliant. OK, thank you so much, guys. Um, oh, OK, we've got one last question. I was going to say we're just almost out of time, but we've got um a question from someone who has said how can i look for new questions around a topic so if it's yeah if you've kind of got a topic in mind like what happens um you know if if you want to kind of see changes around that topic is there any way to do that so so the the kind of alerts functionality that i talked about in answer the public will help you with that um Beyond that, you can just be putting in your seed term in Google suggestions and just monitoring yourself what comes up as the top suggestions. Um, another thing that I was going to mention, because Sam mentioned um, Google Trends as one of the tools that you can use. So I don't know how familiar people are with Google Trends, but the kind of key uh, most well-known part of it is the, the chart that you get at the top that says this is when searches around this thing spiked. But if you scroll down the page a little bit as well, it will tell you um, top rising queries that are related to that term as well. It won't give you a volume again, but it will tell you percentage change. And you can look at that um, at whatever time period you want as well. So. Uh, you could do that based on a topic and that will show you kind of top queries. But yeah, um, I think the best one for me and, and certainly if you're looking to save time and be efficient, uh, if you have some of your key queries set up in Answer the Public um, and get email alerts, then they will actually drop into your inbox when there's a new query around it, which um, is uh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, I've just seen a quote that's come through in the chat that's really made me laugh, and I think we might have to use it to promote the webinars going forward. Um, but Vivek has said, This is the best accidental webinar I have ever attended. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pleased, I'm pleased it was a happy accident. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna have to steal that one, that's great. Okay, um, that's that is all we've got time for though for this month's webinar. Um, thank you guys for, for all being here today. And thanks to Sam and Sophie. We're running these regularly. So the next one is going to be on the 2nd of September. Um, at the same time, we're just finalising the topic for that one, but you'll get the info in the follow-up email, which will also include the video um, of this webinar. So you can watch it back if you want to, and also all of the resources um, that Sophie and Sam mentioned. So, yeah, that's it. I guess you can also go to our Answer the Public channel if you want to look at any of our previous webinars. And as I mentioned earlier, we've got the tutorial video there, which will really help you if you're kind of new to search listening and answer the public as well and just to help you to become an expert. Um, yeah, if you've got any feedback, please do get in touch. We'd love to hear what you think about the content. Um, and yeah, that's it. It's kind of a big thank you to Sam and Sophie for being here today. 
it was really really great to have you guys um yeah we hope to see a lot of you at the next webinar all right thanks guys yeah, bye, thank everyone. you so much see you soon cheers guys <laughs>